Priti is a senior researcher at NASEN and she has worked on the children's mental health studies uh, since 2017. And she's going to tell you more about the follow up studies. Thanks, Mari. So, I'll be presenting an overview of the mental health of children and young people, follow up surveys, um, which is a new and valuable longitudinal resource on children's mental health. And I'll be touching um, on some of the things that Tamsin talked about on, in her presentation. So I'll be covering some background to the survey series, the methodology used, briefly um, talking about the questionnaire content, and um, talking about the series key strengths, and I think most importantly what you um, are all here for, um, how we can access the data and the published reports. So, as Tamsin mentioned, the survey series is funded by the Department of, of Health and Social Care, the Department for Education, and is commissioned by NHS England. And we actually work alongside a consortium of experts in the field of child mental health, so the universities of Cambridge and Exeter, provide expertise in questionnaire content and reporting, and the Office for National Statistics provide analytical input, and they do the weighting for the survey series. Um, and we've also worked alongside Youth in Mind, Robert Goodman, um, who is responsible for de developing the SDQ algorithm. So just looking at the survey timeline here, I know Tamsin's already mentioned this in her presentation, but just touching on this again, um, the follow-up surveys are part of a series of surveys looking at the mental health of children and young people in England with data previously published in 1999, 2004, and um, the most recent survey in 2017. And these were all national surveys conducted face-to-face -face in respondents' homes. The 2017 survey, which is considered the baseline survey, achieved a sample size of over 9,000 children and young people aged between 2 and 19. And in this survey, as Tamsin described, um, mental disorders were um, identified using um, the DORBAR or the Development and Wellbeing Assessment uh, Tool. The DORBAR uses structured questions which ask about symptoms relevant to each disorder type. So that's um, things like um, hyperactivity, emotional uh, disorders, behavioural and less common disorders like autism. The 2017 achieved sample of children and young people were then followed up in a series of follow-up surveys. The so the first of these were actually conducted in 2020 and then in 2021. And this data provided an initial insight into the impacts of COVID-19 on mental health of children and young people. The sample were then followed up again in 2022 and uh, more recently, earlier this year, um, we were with these surveys, we were able to assess um, life for children and young people after the pandemic. Um, and as Tams has already mentioned, um, a measure of mental health, which is the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, or SDQ, was used in all of these follow-up surveys, including the baseline survey. And this provided a consistent um, and robust measure of assessing mental um, disorders in the population. I'll talk about the SDQ in the next slide. Um, and as Tams has already mentioned, it's worth noting that each year the children and young people in our sample have gotten older. So some of the age groups analysed across the published reports are different. So, for example, in 2022, we looked at 7 to 10 year olds. And as this cohort has gotten older by a year, this year, in the 2023 report, we'll be looking at 8 to 10 year olds. So just briefly mentioning the SDQ again. So the SDQ was our main measure of mental health across the follow-up surveys. It's a brief behavioural and emotional screening questionnaire containing 25 items on the child and young person's um, strengths and difficulties with peer relationships, emotions, behaviours and hyperactivity. And parents in our sample were asked to complete the SDQ about their child. Children aged between 11 and 16 were self-reporting as were young adults. And as Tamsin mentioned, there was also a, an impact supplement that, that was asked in addition to the 25 items. 
and this asks the respondent whether they think the ch their child or themselves has a problem and if so inquires further about this problem on different elements such as distress, social impairment and bud burden to others of that problem. The SDQ algorithm combines responses from the parents, the children and young people on symptoms and impact and depending on the scoring it then estimates how likely a child or young person has a possible or probable mental disorder and all the estimates we present in our published reports are based on this algorithm and this distinction. And you can find more information about the SDQ questions and also the scoring system and algorithm in the technical report which is linked on the slide. So if we now briefly touch on the sample design, so to ensure representativeness, the baseline sample, so that's the 2017 sample, was drawn from the NHS patient register held by NHS England. So all participants in the 2017 survey who agreed to be recontacted for future research during their interviews um, and who continued to agree to be recontacted during the follow-up surveys were invited to take part. So moving on to data collection. So one of the key strengths of our survey design is that it uses a multi-informant approach, drawing on three potential sources of information in assessing mental health, rather than just relying on one self-report account. So it uses the parent report for children up to the age of 11. It uses the child and young person's self-report um, from the age of 11 up to young adulthood. A bit more on data collection. So we contacted, a, we contacted priority cases from ethnic minority groups and those living in the most deprived areas of England first by telephone to boost response in, the, in these hard to reach groups. We then opened up the online survey um, to the whole of this sample and non-responders to the online survey were offered support with the, with the survey or given the option to complete the survey uh, via the telephone. So just looking at response rates, um, this table here shows the sample who agreed to be recontacted for the follow-up surveys, the achieved sample size and the response rates for the respective um, survey waves. And the grey column represents the issued sample, the achieved sample and the response rates for the 2017 face-to-face -face baseline survey. Um, so just looking at the latest um, of the follow-up surveys, which was the 22 survey, we achieved a response rate of 40%. And, and we have seen a steady decline in response rates over the years. The first two follow-up surveys were conducted under very different circumstances during lockdown, obviously a very different situation to now. With the latter surveys, sample maintenance has been an issue with non-response and attrition impacting our response rates, as we just discussed, just discussed in Tamsin's presentation. Um, and as Tamsin mentioned, a number of um, engagement activities were conducted before the last, uh, the most recent wave in the form of a participant newsletter, um, a postcard with some snapshots of recent survey findings and a gift uh, given to those who had participated in previous waves, just so that we could boost that sample and um, engage people with this longitudinal survey and more more on responses in the technical technical report if you want to know more so just a brief look at the questionnaire content and just to say here the tables presented in the following slides um, include a variety of content that have been asked across the survey years and are not specific to one survey year so just looking at the parent questionnaire, this included on, um, topics on self-harm, loneliness, changes in household circumstances, for example, questions on the reduction in household income and not being able to buy enough food. There's also been questions on the social impacts of COVID on family life, as well as service contact, a topic that we've asked in um, every single wave so far. Um, moving on to the child questionnaire, this is completed by the 11 to 16 year old themselves and this has included questions on family dynamics, including family functioning, 
experiences of social media, um, including whether they've been bullied online, and feelings towards their neighbourhood and local area, for example, if they feel safe in their local area. And then for young adults, the topics have ranged from an assessment of psychotic-like experiences using the Adolescent Psychotic-like Symptom Screener. There's been an assessment of personality using the SAPAS scale, as well as young people's experiences of education and work. And that's just a really brief snapshot of all the wealth of data, the wealth of data we've included in all the follow-up surveys. So if you do want to know more about individual um, waves, um, there is more information in the technical report. Um, and just to mention briefly here, I think Tamsin touched on it in her presentation. Um, so in the latest survey series, that's the 2023 survey, a follow-up um, was um, included that was looking at eating disorders. So this included an additional module asking more in-depth questions about eating behaviours, feelings and self-image. And as Tamsin mentioned, this included the full Dorber eating disorder content, the avoidant restrictive food intake disorder questionnaire and the mood and feelings questionnaire. And data is currently in progress but each case will be um, sent to the University of Cambridge to be clinically rated. And um, once we get the data back, it, would be, it will be appended to the main data set and will be available in the UK Data Services Archive um, to enable further analyses. And just quickly to highlight some key strengths of the survey series, it's a really valuable data set uh, because we have pre-pandemic baseline data which was collected in 2017, and in all four surveys we've used a consistent and robust me measure of mental health, which is the SDQ, and this will enable us to measure changes over time. The survey series uses a national probability sample of children and young people spanning from childhood right through to emerging adulthood, and as you've just seen, it, it includes a wealth of information on lots of core topics as well as new um, topics year on year. Um, and although the reports have largely been based on cross-sectional analysis, there is the potential for longitudinal analysis and also the possibility of using the survey, da survey data along with administrative records um, such as the National Pupil Database. And finally, the published reports and cross-sectional analysis from the 2017 baseline survey right through to the follow-up surveys are available to um, access on the NHS England's website. There is also supplementary published data tables focusing on children with special educational needs and disabilities which you can have a look at and just to say the 2023 um, report is currently in progress and as Tamsin mentioned we are due to be able to publish that in late autumn this year. And most importantly, um, the data will be available um, through the UK data services. Uh, there'll be instructions on how to access the data. But just to say here that the 2020 data set is imminently due to, for completion. Um, we are hoping that it gets archived in late summer, so really, really soon. The 2021 <coughs> data set is in progress and that should be available um, later this year, the 22 and 23 data sets will follow and should be available the following year. And just to say thank you for listening.